16th of March. Um, and actually, of course, that plan had to be changed because we were right on the um, verge of the pandemic at that point. So um, it's great to be here, albeit through Zoom. Um, sitting in my own um, study down here in London, rather than being up, originally the plan was Edinburgh, but you know, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Aberdeen, Dundee, really, I'm, I wouldn't be fussy. I would just love to be with you in Scotland somewhere at this stage, basically. However, however, that was not to be. So um, when I was going to talk last March, um, I know that this quite obviously was not going to be my topic. Um, my topic was going to be something completely and utterly different. Um, I am, yeah, okay. However, this time it just seems that I had to go with this particular topic. And I know it's the kind of obvious one, um, but it is the topic that seems to me to be the absolutely burning one at the moment. Um, Aileen, could you just confirm that you can see that okay? Yep, I can see it. It's not on presentation mode yet. Okay, let me see if I can put it on presentation mode then. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Thank you. So um, you'll see I've given the title Beyond the COVID 19 pandemic. Those of you who know me will know that I am a, an optimist, so I'm hoping that this is the correct title basically. Um, but I am really interested, fascinated in fact, in what's happened and what are the challenges, what are the opportunities from all of these innovations that we've seen in practice and policy and research. So that is going to be my sort of challenge. I am going to draw on the research which I know has been flooding in through 2020 about what's happened, um, but I'm particularly going to draw on um, a paper which I wrote with my colleague Warren Kidd on what was happening with us in East London at this particular time. I think there, there won't be that many surprises for you because I know that some of these patterns were seen very, very widely but still worth stopping to reflect on them, I think, and to think about what they mean for practice and teacher education into the future, and also for research. Okay, so again, um, oh, here I've been a little less optimistic, haven't I? I've said learning from and in pandemic practices. Um, unprecedented, absolutely unprecedented um, socioeconomic and educational change on a scale that none of us could have envisaged back, even if I go back to March 2020 and the original timetable for the CIRA event, no, we could not have envisaged what was going to happen and the longevity of it. it Aileen referred to that, you know, just how long this has gone on for even now. Um, and who knows for the future. So absolutely unprecedented and posing some extraordinary questions for our societies, I think, in general, as well as for our education systems. So we know that in March 2020, in um, Western countries, there was a move into what Murphy is called emergency e-learning. So um, all of our teacher education systems had to start operating in new online spaces. Um, there was no alternative. Now, I've heard some arguments recently to say that the change we've been through in teacher education, for example, um, and in other areas of practice in higher education is not actually that substantial, that some things changed, i.e. the learning moved online, but other things did not. And those commentators have pointed out that many fields were already engaged quite substantially in online learning, in using new technologies for their learning and had a, had a strong base of e-learning. Now, I know that there are teacher education courses that exist almost entirely online, that are taught almost entirely online, but as a field, we have not been systematically and wholeheartedly engaged in online learning 
before this pandemic struck. So we haven't been one of those fields which have taken up e-learning, as it's sometimes called, in education. And many of you will know, going right back to the beginning of the century, the work, work of Bridget Somek, um, groundbreaking work on teaching and learning with ICT, and Diana Lorillard, whose work on teacher as designer, I've always really enjoyed. And teacher as designer, I think, and teacher educator as designer, is a phrase that has come right back into our lexicon, basically. But my point overall is that teacher education has not been systematically involved in online learning. So for us, this was a very significant change. Um, the article I refer to there on the PowerPoint, Dimmant and Downing, is um, a study by two Australian researchers looking at studies of research on, in online teacher education. And they argue that the provision um, has been very disjointed. There have been some really outstanding innovations in the past in teacher education. And I'm not saying that they haven't, but in the main, it's been patchy, it's been fragmented. It's not an area that we have wholeheartedly embraced. However, come March, April, May, 2020, there we were engaged in the rapid generation of online pedagogies and structures for teacher education. So I've called these um, the pragmatic um, and studies from across the world show that very similar things happened in the teacher education systems that were there. There was a pragmatic move. There was a restructuring move. Um, Linda Laval et al. did a, um, a study looking at how the universities reacted to the pandemic, what kind of structures they put in place. And obviously, there was an enormous pragmatism there. Um, in England, for example, um, our Department of Education issued an edict saying that it expected all students who were on our PGCE courses, our one-year courses, to be in schools in September. Um, no change. Um, they were waiving um, some of the items around the requirements for us around um, practice and the number of days in practice. But apart from that, it was our job to make sure that those students started as new teachers in September. So there had to be a pragmatic element. There had to be a patchy element to it, or there was, should I say, a patchy element. Patchy polite is is perhaps a polite word here. Um, we know that the provision was highly differentiated in the way that students were able to receive it. Let me put it like that. So we're all familiar with the issues around online access, for example, um, and broadband and um, use of appropriate technologies, phone, the appropriate phones, the appropriate uh, laptops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But far more than that, there were issues around um, who who was able to benefit from this. I think we're only just beginning to scratch the surface on this one. Um, for example, we had students who we found out could not engage properly in the online provision because they were at home with five, six, seven siblings who are also sharing the, work, the broadband. We know, um, for example, that some of our teacher educators were at home with children. Um, I had one head of PGC who was um, online constantly with all four of her children um, around her. I hope they learned a lot. Um, maybe they'll be the next generation of teachers, who knows? But there were, there were things like that, obvious things about who's not who's not able to participate fully here, but more subtle things around whose styles of learning, whose ways of learning just did not connect here, who was not in an appropriate personal space. And I don't mean a physical space, I mean a mental space where they could participate and take part in the learning. So there are some really, really um, major questions around participation and ability to participate, which make that provision patchy at best. Um, there was definitely a performative element. I don't know what happened at your universities, but at ours, 
um, using Teams, there were ways in which um, managers could look at who was online when, with how many students, at what point. Um, and there was that external sort of surveillance going on and checking of teachers, of teacher educators, professional practices. There was also an enormously personal performative check going on. Um, I mean, in the account that we had, there are teacher educators who are really engaging, if not over engaging with their students. And I'll come through to that again in a moment. So personal performativity and the pressures of that was an issue. Perfectionism, perfecting, um, that I think was also an issue because for some people time expanded, for others time contracted of course and that depended very much on the educator's personal circumstances as well as the students. But for some people their time expanded and um, for example visits to schools just could not take place obviously. Um, so all of that travel time, all of that extra time um, all of that sort of um, maintenance time in schools became trimmed down. Um, there was a distinct tendency to aim for perfectionism in some of our data. And lastly, there was the inspired. And I really do mean inspired. Um, some of the educators that we researched and some of the people I've read about in many of the accounts of 2020 have been engaged in quite extraordinary pedagogies online and have really moved on this sense of what does being in this new space, in this online spatial environment, what does this mean for us? What are the opportunities here? Okay, so at that point, I will move on and just show you, this is the article that I'm going to talk about. It went into the European Te Journal of Teacher Education just at the end of the summer. Um, and one of the things I'll come back to at the end of the presentation is just how much research was pouring out and how um, fast the journals and the publishers suddenly revealed themselves to be um, in responding. Uh, quite a transformation in our field. Okay, um, here are the key questions which we used in our study. Um, England, as you know, has... Um, a teacher education, an initial teacher education system, which has what um, Claire Kosnick and Lynn Goodwin have called a hyper emphasis on practice. So our PGC students have to have 24 weeks out of 36 in schools. Um, they have to have a whole string of requirements around those practices. And um, practice is definitely seen as the central element of the teacher education curriculum. Now, at the point at which um, the pandemic struck and schools closed, basically our PGCE students had a long practicum ahead of them. So the majority of their practicum was ahead of them at this point. It varied from course to course, but basically they had the majority of their time in the classroom that very valuable experience in the classroom itself still to come, okay? So, and of course, suddenly it was not possible for them to have a practical experience. All the assessments, all the curriculum were crafted around the fact that, around the idea that they would be out in school at this point in time, and the teacher educators would be engaged in working with mentors and school partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a critical point in the IT system, as I'm sure it was for many of you, but particularly because of that hyperemphasis on practice. Um, we had this state of emergency or forced online learning suddenly occurring, and we had to respond to it for hundreds and hundreds of students, as I'm sure, again, was the case for many of you. Okay. Right, so... Um, what we looked at was we interviewed and we asked people what they were actually doing in these new spaces with this new curriculum that had to emerge. Um, the assessment stayed more or less the same and the assessment was master's level um, work looking at practice, which of course most of the students couldn't have and hadn't had 
So the assessment structures stayed the same, but the curriculum engagement had to change. So I'm sure some of these will seem very familiar to you, but in the new online spaces, we found people doing things like a chemistry tutor um, was engaged in what she called kitchen chemistry online. So she on Zoom, she had the students working in their own homes, but still practicing um, and implementing experiments together. So they were actually, a lot, I mean, I really, I'm not a chemist. I don't know what they would have been doing in their kitchens, but presumably there are some suitable chemistry um, chemicals in kitchens that they could work with because this became kitchen chemistry online. Um, the educator was there watching them and being able to bring out the different applications as they actually did that practical work. So we did find in the study that practical subjects, so two that came up for us were chemistry and music, practical subjects were particularly tricky when it came to reinventing the um, curriculum and reinventing a sense of practice um, as an online practicum, if you like. So the kitchen chemistry was one example. Um, people use Flipgrid to provide on an online form of micro teaching. And again, after students taught certain experiments or taught certain concepts, they could using Flipgrid reflect and receive feedback from the educator and from their peers. We had one subject group, and um, this was actually religious education, where students shared uh, an online home classroom. And this was a group of students, many of whom had children of their own, who of course were doing online schooling. Um, and they combined together so that one of them would organize um, the teaching and undertake the teaching. And the rest of them would watch um, look at the small lesson study, look at us, make it into a small lesson study, sorry. Um, they could observe each other um, as student parents, as student teachers, and they could discuss their children's learning. I know that they did this with mixed age ranges. My, um, my heart goes out to them. Mixed age range teaching, I think, is always was always something of a challenge for me. And I know the age ranges here were really quite varied. And they also did it across continents because some students had gone back to countries like Jamaica or Nigeria um, and were therefore tuning in at different time zones, basically. Um, popular tools were Padlet and Jamboard. Um, now, again, those were new to educate to some of our educators. So our central education, our central learning and teaching unit came in big time here to support the teacher educators to use those kind of tools. Um, those tools became the site of communication, discussion and debate, albeit debate in writing, but they were invaluable in putting the community back in when the pandemic had actually taken so much away. Um, I have learned, I'm one of the people who's learned to use Padlet during this pandemic. I am so impressed by it. Um, Pete Boyd and I have used it quite extensively for our um, Becoming a Teacher Educator course for the Teacher Education Advancement Network, which some of you may know. And the discussions on Padlet have been quite extraordinary um, and have really enriched the face, I can say face to face, I mean um, Zoom to Zoom sessions, live sessions that we have been able to come and have. So online writing circles, these were extensively used. I think all the PGC students used these. It was a way of supporting the students. They were pragmatic, but it was meaningful engagement with this master's level assignment that they had to do. Um, the writing circles and the sharing through them ensured regular interaction and purposefulness and extended learning. Um, we ended up with the highest marks for that assignment that we've ever seen. Um, not surprising, of course, because the students were not in classrooms juggling their um, teaching practice with writing this assignment or hurriedly doing it over the half-term break. 
but those writing assignments were amazing. And when we talked and debriefed all of this as a team, thinking about student learning, we had some really um, spirited debates about what the students had gained from this time, as well as very obviously what some of, some of them, and in a sense, all of them had lost. Um, final example is a YouTube channel, um, which became a resource bank for online teaching demonstrations. And here, the person who set this up was able to get um, teacher educators, the current students, ex-students, um, members of the school, part, school university partnerships into teaching and debating and sharing their practice online in a really extensive way. Um, we do obviously have sharing sessions with um, mentors, with the partnership schools. We do have sharing with students. There is opportunity, of course, for our students to learn from experienced teachers. But this was an extraordinary resource. And we said that the students benefited from many more voices in the room. So many more um, sources of expertise than they were previously have had. Okay, so our um, summary of all of this was that the pandemic generated um, what my colleague Warren Kidd has called pedagogic agility. So there was that initial time when it was emergency learning, when it was really straightforward pragmatics, when it was just let's try and get as many students back online in contact with us as we possibly can, however we can. Um, but that actually shifted over time as we went on through the rest of um, the spring and the summer term to accommodate far more meaningful practices and practices which at their best, and as I say, this is patchy, so I won't over gloss it, but at their best, some of these practices were actually making extraordinary use of this new spatiality in teacher education this new online space shifted things. Again, I'm sure this won't be an unfamiliar point, but some of the conventional dynamics, the power relations of student, teacher and teacher educator conversations, for example, were upended, not least because in some cases, um, the students were better with technology than the teacher educators were. Um, we found it was very noticeable that in conversations with mentors, the mentors were more forthcoming in the online spaces than they might have been typically in the face-to-face -face situations. So there were those kind of power shifts, but there was also a very profound difference in the way that we think knowledge was generated. So these educators, became, they learned to be flexible, they very swiftly learned to be flexible in these bounded learning spaces, in these new, this new spatiality, which absolutely fascinates me, you know, how this is so different, in many ways so similar, but in other ways so very different to our practice face to face, but they learned to make rapid decisions over practice in swift and meaningful ways became key for the very best educators engaged, fully engaged with the students who were able to do so. So we'd argued that practice evolved to be agile with educators gaining confidence, acting rationally, and with a really clear sense of purpose about the good of student learning. So all the intents, all the sort of um, plans were there for this to happen. Now, what was so powerful there was that it was pre-existing values that underpinned, the, sorry, the pre-existing values which had underpinned previous practices were what facilitated those adaptations. So that was what lifted them beyond the simple initial e-learning responses, the emergency responses, through to where are we going with this? What are we doing with this? Um, so those values we found were persistent over time. Okay, 
So emerging from the pandemic, um, I hope, again, me being an optimist, um, about teacher educators themselves. That persistence of the pre-existing values in new practices, I think is really important to note. As teacher educators, we know that these kind of values has, have been at the heart of our practices over, over a long, long time um, in face-to-face -face practices. Student support, student professional development, but also student holistic care. And I know at various times in the history of teacher education in England, there has been pushback around that idea of student care and holistic care, but that is what we were finding. And that is what I, I personally think is an enduring value for us in the work we do with students. So we found intensified work patterns for teacher educators during the pandemic. Now, those varied according to personal circumstances. So intensified work patterns for those with children of school age included, of course, um, homeschool schooling responsibilities and caring responsibilities. So that was a heavy, heavy burden, which drove teacher education work into different temporal spaces for some of those people into early mornings, into evenings into very late evenings. But for other people, as I say, the loss of established routines like going out to schools meant that they became engaged in intensified work patterns. Um, that striving for perfectionism became important there. That striving for student support, for student development, for holistic care was really important. Um, all of this has led me um, to think about what kind of professional learning happened for teacher educators during the pandemic. It was quite clearly profound and it was quite clearly not just about learning to use these new technologies. Um, it wasn't just about becoming, um, becoming at ease with Teams or Zoom or Padlet or Jamboard or whatever sort of technologies you were using. It was a more profound shift particularly in terms of um, generating new practices, generating uh, an effectively new curriculum to replace the practice in schools. Um, I've had been having a look at the international research on this learning recently and how people worked. And there's quite a stark shift. Some teacher educators clearly felt that they were isolated that they learnt by themselves as autodidacts, that they really were cut off from their, their peers. Um, however, other people have stressed the sheer communality of this time and the peer group support that was available to them within their teacher education teams. As I mentioned, for some teacher educators as well, their um, the out of discipline support from the teaching and learning units, the generic higher education teaching and learning units, really swung in. But whichever way you looked at it, there was profound um, professional learning during that time. Uh, what I've um, conventionally called teaching using IT, I don't think that's enough to describe what happened at all, but that was previously an identified need for teacher educators professional learning. So my colleague Jerry Chinesky, along with Yvonne at um, Aberdeen and the rest of our group InfoTed, our Teacher Educators Professional Learning Group, they looked at this um, a while back and they found that um, teaching and learning with technology was a clearly identified need for teacher educators back in 2016, 2017. Now, I'd be interested to know, uh, given the accelerated professional learning over the last year, where that professional learning need is now and how professional learning needs for us as an occupational group have shift, shifted. Sorry. Um, last point here, patterns of research engagement during the pandemic. Um, personal engagement in research, I think, probably worked around and across these intensified work patterns. So I think it depended very much on people's personal circumstances. But 
the amount of research pouring out was quite extraordinary, as I mentioned earlier. Amazing amount of publications in 2020 on what was happening and how and why, including some very, very early um, in the pandemic. There was an American um, co-publication that came out in at the end of April, um, which was quite extraordinary. Um, the, and, and I know people who edit journals, so this might be Aileen and colleagues, um, have found that you know, there have been so many submissions to journals over this time. So patterns of research engagement really interest me. And what beyond the kind of study which Warren and I did, you know, what is happening here, that kind of study, what else was coming out during this extraordinary time in our field as research? Okay, now my next emphasis really is about coming out of this pandemic um, and what will happen to these new online spaces and the pedagogical innovations that we've experienced. What will happen to them long term? Um, I imagine that for many of you, as for us, many previous modes of teaching and learning are returning. So most of our students are now back into some sort of classroom, some sort of school classroom. There are exceptions, but most of them are back. Um, some of those traditional modes of engagement between mentors, students and teacher educators are happening again, although in the main teacher educators are still not allowed into schools because of COVID restrictions. So things are returning. Some of our undergraduate students are returning to face-to-face -to -face teaching. Some are still online across a week of practice. So the old modes are coming back. But I'm still interested in what will happen to those new spaces and those pedagogical innovations. And saying that, I do acknowledge that there were some very significant losses. I mean, the loss of the practicum itself, um, I know posed a huge loss to that, that year of students who are now in their NQT years in our schools. I know there were differentiated um, restrictions and I know that socioeconomic position in society played, played a huge part in that for many of our students. So very significant losses with that move to online learning. And of course, there is no clarity around learning only online and its ability to provide a sort of viable um, alternative, in part, wholly, to the authenticity of learning through face-to-face -face interactions with educators and face-to-face -face interactions with students and children in school. So acknowledging all of that, I'm still fascinated by whether or not the experiences of the past year do really signal new possibilities for reframing traditional modes of teacher education. Um, if so, how is that kind of reframing, reconsidering, re-questioning re ourselves? How is that reflection going to happen? Um, is it at the level of the individual? I know some of the educators we interviewed for our study were changing their individual provision on PGCE secondary courses, for example, that, where they have their own subject and they were planning to revise their courses considerably to incorporate online learning more. But is that going to be at an institutional level, at a national level of the system, et cetera, et cetera? How do we get a grip with this and see if there is anything that should be um, surviving in some way, perhaps alongside those traditional modes of teacher education. And then research. Um, I do think, despite the kind of plethora of research that came out in 2020, I do think now is the time to be doing a more considered look at what happened and why and how. Um, I know there are studies underway across the world on looking at that um, cohort of students who came out of that first pandemic year, I imagine those studies will expand to embrace these, the students who came out, uh, who will come out in September 2021, 
who will be the NQT cohort for 2021-22, but to look at those students because many of the accounts that have been written to date are about how the system accommodated the change um, or how individual educators and groups of educators accommodated the change. They haven't looked or been able to look yet on the impact on students. So I think there's a great deal of research that needs to be done there. So that leads on to my questions. And as Aileen said, these are not questions that you need to stick to in your discussions. They are just an indication of my curiosity. Um, the first one is about your own practices, your own innovations, those in your own universities, which were implemented during the pandemic. The second is about endurance. Are there things that you anticipate will endure in your personal practice or your communal practice once this pandemic era is over? And third is what do you think the priorities for research are now? And particularly as you're the CIRA network for teacher education, are there imperatives that you think CIRA might be looking at into the future? Okay, thank you very much indeed for listening. Thank you, Jean. Sorry, I was about to unmute and then suddenly my screen moved. And <laughs> I couldn't find the button. Thank you so much um, for such a stimulating and incredibly well-informed presentation. I can see loads of um, virtual claps there. I can't imagine there's anybody in the room who didn't hear something that made them reflect on their own practice. So we've all got something now to be be thinking about to be, um, to be asking about so we're going to open up the, um, the chat and the hands up please for any questions or discussion points i'm just going to put jean's questions in the chat as well so that oops press. okay so there they are in the chat so that we've got them there as well so Rachel will um, keep an eye on the chat and um, maybe group together questions if that seems suitable or, um, or read them out. And if anyone's up for asking a question to the floor, then please raise your hand. Am I missing someone there? No. Okay, maybe I can kick off the questions then, um, since I've given it a polite um, period of thinking time there. <laughs> I'm curious, Jean, about the, I mean, I'm persuaded by that conceptualization of pedagogic agility, but I'm curious about how we sustain that, because it seems to me that that's only possible or even permissible in a context where our usual parameters have been um, perhaps made more flexible. And I'm curious about how in institutions and in a system where we have such rigid systems in place for standardization and quality assurance, how we might retain the space for this pedagogic agility. Um, I'm not expecting you necessarily to have all the answers, but I'm wondering if that's maybe something that your participants spoke about. Yes, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because obviously time of unprecedented change, time of emergency, you know, here we go. Whoops, sorry. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I've forgotten to turn the phone off. Um, rookie error on Zoom, sorry folks. Um, <laughs> It, it obviously was that very unusual space. Um, I have to say, it, despite all the kind of grief around losing the practicum, and I do, in saying this, I do acknowledge how major, major that was for the students. There was something of breath of fresh air for us in England because we've been so tied to this idea of, you know, you better, more time in the classroom means better quality learning. Um, that has almost been the spoken mantra 
in um, English teacher education for a long time now. Um, so to actually have space to say, wait a minute, they can't go into the classroom, they cannot learn from practice as we understood it in a, in a conventional way. How else can we recreate practice online was amazing. Um, and, and I'd probably say that more as a kind of curious researcher and curious teacher educator curriculum developer than I do as somebody um, who is over concerned with quality assurance because we've been given the space, we've been given this permission just to sort of um, prepare, us, prepare them as best you can. Um, I think there were some very, very significant um, developments at individual levels. Um, so I mentioned the patchiness. Um, please don't repeat this, <laughs> um, Chatham Health rules, but um, our provision went from absolutely extraordinary to fairly, you know, good, but fairly basic. So I think the first thing is maybe individual level to accommodate those spaces within conventional teaching, perhaps within conventional practice for individuals. But the second is to start sharing it. And the only way we can get shared practice out there is through being honest and making that public and actually doing that kind of sharing, whether through conventional research publications, which probably that factory is going, that factory line is going to slow down again. So maybe through things like blogs to say, you know, this is what I'm doing. This is how I'm trying to do this. Um, this is what I'm experimenting with now. Um, to, to keep trying to share those innovations would be my kind of first take on that. Mm -hmm. Over to other people for comments as well. Thanks, Jean. Um, Rachel, I see there's a fair few questions now. Do you want to perhaps um, select something from there or, or give us a summary of some of the issues for Jean to respond to? Um, yeah, so we've got a question about the writing cycles, whether that includes staff as well as students. Then. We've got for, from Robert, we've got um, what do you yourself, Jean, think will stick post pandemic in terms of reactions and um, innovations? And then from Pauline, um, I thought an interesting point about what are school, what are, do we know now what schools are saying about the new teachers that have gone through the system, you know, during the pandemic? And then what does that maybe say about? Uh, in terms of changing the system, you know, if, um, in terms of that. And then from Mark, who's down as the same collective, I think, um, about really other wider questions, you know, beyond the pandemic um, that, that we need to, to address um, rather than just looking at online learning. So if I leave it at those ones for now. So the um, question about the student writing circles, um, there was staff involvement in most of those. Um, I believe that in many cases, students did do spin-offs. And of course, the students, some of them, not all of them, but some of them were hyper-connected, connected to one another. Um, I don't wish to make glib assumptions about millennials and their um, IT skills, but it was quite clear that some of the students had extensive networks on every platform you can possibly think of and were talking to each other quite extensively, but the formal writing circles, yes, there was staff involvement in most of those um, to support the writing process, um, not least because a you know, good proportion of our students are mature and they do have um, home responsibilities, they do have personal responsibilities, and this time, as you know, was extremely um, challenging. Um, so next question from Robert, what do I think will stick? Um, I think but from the people who really were convinced by some of these te new technologies, I call them new technologies because I'm not a millennial, um, I think some of those will stick. So if I give you a personal example, Pete Boyd and I, as I said, uh, have run this um, Becoming a Teacher Educator course for TEEN and various other organisations since 2007. We've always done it in the same way. We have written guidelines. We have um, an online, uh, sorry, a normally a face-to-face -face session, perhaps around a conference, perhaps a discreet face-to-face session. We've always done it the same way. You know, we have changed the teaching emphases, I hasten to add, you know, we're not that 
staid and boring, but we have always done it in the combination of written product, read this, plus um, the actual face-to-face -face interactions. This year we used Padlet, um, it, at plus Zoom meetings, it was such, it was a much, much, much better course. It was a much more inclusive course. Um, I'd be the first to say that it sort of revolutionized a, a, um, a provision that we were both quite fond of, but was becoming a little bit, you know, oh, here we go again. It was amazing. So we have already said that next year we hope the team conference will run again and that these, we will have at least one face-to-face -face meeting it, within that conference setting. That would be a joy, actually. That would be wonderful to see people face-to-face. -face. But we will also um, think about how we sculpt Padlet provision and the reading around that so that by the time people come to the conference, they do know each other and they do know who we are. They have seen our sometimes rather opinionated writing online, you know, and they've had a chance to post post their reactions to that before they come to the conference. So I hope that something like that kind of hybrid provision will survive and that as teacher educators, we will become more engaged with online learning and appreciate far more its potential. Because I do think we've been a field where we've stepped back and, and gone, hmm, no, you know, let, let's stick with the real thing, um, which of course is immensely valuable, but you know, maybe we need to um, get a bit more millennial, basically. No, I'm, I'm being glib there, so not millennial. Okay, um, school and teacher feedback about changes. I don't know what's happening there, to be honest. I would be really interested to hear from colleagues who are based in school um, anecdotally about this cohort. Um, and I know there are studies underway looking at their learning and how they felt about the whole thing. Because as I said, of course, the studies that I was talking about are solely written from the point of view of the educators. Uh, yeah. Yes, and I maybe just say on that point um, that we have within our number here, um, Rachel and Mark, who carried out a, a bit of a sub-study as part of the wider MQUITE measuring quality and ITE study, which didn't so much look at the, the question that I think Pauline's asking about how teachers feel about these um, new teachers, but it did ask the, the new teachers themselves how well prepared they felt for, um, well, you can word it better than I can, Rachel or Mark, I can't remember the exact research question, but how well prepared they felt to work in, in new and innovative ways in times of crisis or, or significant change. And I think that's an interesting scene of work that's coming out from, from that study. I don't know if you want to say anything, Rachel or Mark, that you think relates to that point. Well, um, it was just that the, the teachers that um, joined our focus, you know, volunteered to take part in our focus groups. Um, it, in a way, because everyone's practice had to change, it put them on a level playing field with the experienced teachers that they were working alongside and they, they sort of grabbed that opportunity. So what you were saying, Jean, about how, you know, they were on lots of different networks and platforms, you know, with um, their peers, finding out, doing lots of how-to videos for other colleagues and just very engaged. Yeah, and there's a lot of CPD as well, wasn't there? You, you'd be talking to teachers saying they, they stayed up all night preparing resources and then they're telling you, oh, I had a week off and I went to this great conference. So I, I think so, yeah, being able to do things that you, wouldn't normally be able to do or, or might, just might not think to do the idea that you would spend a day on your laptop to go to a conference was probably quite a niche idea but everybody was doing it. Absolutely, thanks both. Um, is, it, is that Yvonne, is that a hand up or just a hello? <laughs> no, no, it was a hand up Aileen, thank you. Um, and it's for Jean and others kind of following on from that, I'm wondering what um, might emerge or what we should be finding out about what might emerge in terms of the changes to education generally in schools, because I can't imagine, I'm hoping it's not just all going to go back to the same. There must be some other 
impact from the schools changes to their practice during lockdown and everything else and therefore what the lessons for us as teacher educators um, in terms of what we need to do to help students be better prepared as well for all these innovations and you know other changes that may come rapidly and are likely to come rapidly um, over the next few years as well. Yes, um, I um, have seen the data from a study which um, my colleague Warren Kidd did, um, again, very early in the pandemic. It was with a school in East London, which was already using online learning quite substantially. So they already had um, online learning going on within the classroom. Um, incidentally, I can see we've got somebody here from India um, and it just so happened that this school was actually connected up to a school in India um, for the children to um, correspond, to write letter, to write letters, listen to me, to write messages to the school in India to learn with them. So they had a connection already um, with this school and they had an engagement in online learning. Um, and the children were used to um, a degree of online learning, even the very young children. And the data quite clearly shows that there was a confidence with those teachers. And it's all, there's also some data about the parents. The parents were actually more at ease with this move to online learning. So it wasn't seen so much as um, an alternative, at times a second best alternative, a rather tiresome alternative for their children's learning. It was seen almost as a kind of extension of what the children were already doing. And that was the result of some really committed teachers in that school who decided that this was going to be their initiative um, and then had given their colleagues the appropriate CPD to be able to join in with that. So, you know, very lucky school really. But I think that's one example of how, again, some kind of hybrid mode might, might be applicable with, for the future, basically. I think that's the kind of thing I was thinking about, Jean, in terms of a schools recognise some of the um, benefits, the constraints as well, but benefits of having this hybrid mode uh, in solving some problems in some way. I wonder then if we need to do more about ensuring that uh, future teachers have got that whole skill set of being a, an online educator as well as a classroom based face to face educator. Uh, I think that's kind of that's a question and interest that I have uh, as well. Yes, and I think there was evidence that um, the teacher educators, not just in our study, but in a lot of the international research coming in, the teacher educators were, were aware of themselves as people who were modelling online learning, even if they were sometimes doing it imperfectly and they were often stumbling with the technology, there was that awareness that this could well be part of the future to prepare students for, um, actually for a world in which hybrid learning is much, much more common. So yes, good point. Thanks, Jean and everybody. Um, we're gonna to have to draw this section of the, the event to a close, but it's just, it uh, been an amazing opportunity to actually hear your perspective from England, to have comment from India. I see in the chat some um, a resource and some comment from Ireland. And this is truly one of the joys of being forced to work in this way. So Jean, a massive thank you from all of us for such a topical, interesting and thought provoking presentation and for being our first keynote speaker of the brand new Teacher Education Network. So massive thank you to you, Jean. Thank you, everybody. It's been great to be with you. It Thanks, is Jean. always odd not to be able to hear the massive applause, but we could see it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Rachel to lead us through the next part of the event, which is just as exciting, it's the formal launch of the book that Rachel edited, Teacher, Edu Teacher Preparation in Scotland. So over to you, Rachel. Um, thanks, Aileen. And um, 
Thank you, Jean, and all the contributors there. That was a really interesting discussion. So um, here's the book. There we go. With it, uh, I think there's eight of the 15 contributors yeah, um, are here today, which is wonderful, especially seeing I think I forgot to email everyone specially to, to, to tell them about today's event. <laughs> and what we've got um, today, I thought I would just um, sort of let you know, we thought it'd be good uh, rather than just focusing on 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 the book, but obviously we're hoping you'll you'll read, is uh, just it might be useful for people in the network to see how um, and the different stages in in the book, and then what we've got is so I'm just going to speak for. A